my name is Paolo Zanetti, and uh, today we are going to have an interview with uh, Dr. Steve Hanna, who is one of the founding fathers of uh, air pollution modeling. Um, I will be helped by my good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Nicolas Busiopoulos. And uh, um, so, um, good afternoon, Steve, and uh, good evening, uh, Nicolas. Hello, both of you. Hello. Very good. Hello. I can hear you well. Um, so, um, this interview is a part of the activities that we are doing as part of the Air Pollution Scientific Initiative, APSI, which started a few months ago. Uh, our goal with APSI is to create a, a repository of scientific information on air pollution, a complete repository which will be multilingual and evolving in time. Um, and this repository will contain papers, lesson, video lessons, uh, uh, all the information that a person may need to learn more about air pollution at the basic, intermediate or advanced level. Very good. Um, I and if I may add, uh, Paolo, yeah. especially important also for educational purposes, uh, young people, even the adults who want to learn something uh, on air pollution modeling, so this is very important also for the future, I believe. I, I agree, and uh, especially for emerging countries with limited resources, they will be able to find all this material mm -hmm. at different levels with hopefully fully automatic translation of everything, including the video with subtitle in any, any language. So we are working on that. So before we start with, with, uh, with Steve, uh, uh, Nicolas, uh, you want to add anything to what I said so far? No, thank you very much. Very I said good. Something and that's enough. So, Steve, mm -hmm. uh, good afternoon again. Uh, congratulations for your wonderful and long career. And we would like to start with uh, with a summary. Can you give us a summary of your professional career? Okay, and the, thank you, and the congratulations. Uh, uh, I hope I'm, I am still continuing working on this, so I hope to continue as long as I can. They, they say that old meteorologists don't die, they just fade away exponentially. Ah, uh, that's MacArthur, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I've had uh, a career that's, that started uh, back, uh, you know, people usually say, well, how did you get into meteorology? And most people, I'm like most people, it was when I was in high school and near Rochester, New York, there was a big thunderstorm and I liked earth sciences to begin with, but the, the, I thought that's really cool, that big thunderstorm. So from then on, I wanted to be a meteorologist. And uh, unfortunately in New York State at the time, there was only one meteorology school at Cornell, and that was agricultural meteorology. Now there's many meteorology schools, in, including SUNY Albany is a big one, but it didn't exist then. So I went to the closest big meteorology school to my home, which was Penn State. And you had to drive down for about four hours south of Rochester to get to Penn State and ended up in the meteorology there and went all the way through getting a BS, MS, and PhD. Now I was told uh, that you really shouldn't go to the same school that you, for graduate school that you went to for undergraduate. So I did apply to MIT and I was rejected. <laughs> so my fallback school was Penn State. So that's why I ended up there and was very lucky to have Hans Panofsky and others as mentors to help me. And after that, I, uh, you know, I should point out, I was completely naive. I didn't really know what I was doing. And so Hans Panofsky said, uh, oh, we have a couple people coming uh, to give job interviews. One is Frank Gifford at ATDL. So I said, okay. So I went in there 
And that's where I ended up working, starting work there in 1967 and continued through 1981. But that was very lucky because they, he is, was a, an internationally known expert and had all kinds of ideas to work on. So after that, I, after about 14 years, I, I moved to the consulting business, uh, ERT in Concord, Massachusetts. So why did I do that? One reason uh, is Gifford had retired and I applied for the uh, director's position at ATDL, but I didn't get that. I was only 36, so they gave it to an older person. And other reasons is I, I really wanted to get into the consulting business because I thought I could get things done and produce deliverables on time. So, so I ended up at ERT in Boston for uh, for four years. And then Tom Lavery, who was in our air modeling group, recruited uh, me and about and four other people to form a separate company. And I still don't know why I did, did, did that, but I agreed to do it. And we started out fresh, you know, with hardly any clients and built a consulting business on dispersion and meteorology modeling. Uh, but then Lavery got tired of it and left for another place. And we ended up selling out after five years to another company and became EarthTech. And I stayed there until my employment agreement ran out after five years in 97. And then uh, did uh, two things. One formed Hannah Consultants, which is my consulting, one person consulting company that I'm still doing. And uh, I went down to George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, where Department of Defense wanted to set up a new department uh, with doing uh, meteorology and dispersion that was close to their offices in the DC area, to the Pentagon and so on. So I did that and after that uh, responsibility ended, I came back to Maine and at the same time, I've been uh, had a position at Harvard School of Public Health as an uh, adjunct associate professor all during that time. So I'm still, I guess the two things I wanted to mention that are important in my career is I've always done uh, boundary layer turbulence and dispersion that's gone through everything. A lot of people aren't that lucky to be able to continue to work on the same thing. And the other is that through uh, the serendipity of my jobs, I've worked with several agencies. So I end up uh, knowing all the people in Department of Defense and people in Europe and, and EPA and Department of Energy and so on. So I've had a lot of contacts and it's been fun to work and network together with people. So that's sort of a quick overview of my professional career. I can confirm, of course, that uh, Steve is uh, a very uh, well-known person in Europe. Uh, he yep. is, uh, has a excellent contacts. But what I would, would like to ask you, Steve, is you mentioned already Banovsky, you mentioned Gifford. Could you tell us a little more on some of your uh, uh, first colleagues who might, may not be with us anymore? Uh, because it's good for, for the future to, to have some statements on such important persons who uh, more or less defined uh, the, uh, uh, all the theory uh, and all the practice which we should fo followed uh, in the decades. You had such an excellent talk in our conference this year. So could you tell us something about such uh, colleagues? Uh, okay, the, well at Penn State, as I said, my uh, advi thesis advisor was Hans Panofsky, which I, I really lucked out because he was very efficient. He had a project that he just handed over to me, uh, you know, namely uh, there was a public health uh, supported project. There was no EPA then, but this was the New York City Air Quality Program run by Ben Davidson. And I, I was getting my funding from that. 
And uh, you probably know Bob Bornstein, yep. and he's, he's still active. And he actually was funded by the same project, but he was in New York at N NYU at the, at the time. But anyway, Panofsky was just super efficient. And he was uh, one of the people who, I, uh, who can explain basic science very straightforward manner. And I still remember his explanation of the total derivative, break, you know, breaking down into the partial respect to time and then the advective terms. And the example he used was the, the price of ties as you're driving from Chicago to New York. <laughs> so the price changes in time locally, and it also changes as you're driving along. <laughs> I still remember that. And uh, the other thing was the mass uh, continuity and divergence and convergence. And that was explained through the jelly sandwich principle. That if you have two slices of bread with jelly in between them and you press down, the jelly comes out the side. So uh, th those were keystones <laughs> of his uh, teaching style. And he would explain things in a very simple way that everybody could explain. Mm -hmm. And you know, his brother, by the way, Erwin Panofsky, was the director of the Stanford L Linear Accelerator uh, lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Hans used to refer to himself as the dumb Panofsky. <laughs> so then I, you know, as I, as I said, I went to uh, ATDL. Oh, and there's sort of a common thread between Penn State and ATDL. While I was at Penn State, there was a, a guy from England who came and taught a, pro, a course on atmospheric diffusion for one semester as a visiting guy, and it was Frank Pasquale. And at the time, I'd never heard of him. You know, I just went to this class and took it. <laughs> thought, oh, that's interesting. And then later, we became friends and worked together on things. And he would always say, oh, yeah, Steve was in my class. Uh, he was the best student I ever had. And I would remind him that, why did you give me a B then? <laughs> <laughs> and he did, he gave me a B in the class. So anyway, I went to ATDL in Oak Ridge with uh, Frank Gifford. And Gifford um, was another excellent person like Panofsky who could had a lot of ties around the world and was full of ideas for doing research. So there was just a countless number of things you could work on. And at the time, you could get money uh, very easily from your sponsoring agency. And at ATDL, Gifford used to write a one-page proposal every year that he sent to the Department of Energy and NOAA. And the proposal base said, and we're going to work on transport and dispersion problems. <laughs> and then gave a few examples. And then they would say, okay, great, and send a million dollars <laughs> or something. And you could never get away with that now. You know, you have to write extensive proposals and justifications and details of what you're gonna do and everything. So uh, that was a lot of fun at ATDL. And, and the other person I'd like to mention, and I think you got a slide of Gary Briggs. Yep. Who, Gary was actually, he and I were together at Penn State. He was a graduate student at the same time that I was. And uh, so Gary was, uh, and this picture is from the ATDL offices in Oak Ridge from probably about 1975. Uh, for the new, P, new students that are looking this, that he, what he's holding in his hand is called chalk. <laughs> and that's called a chalkboard, which you wrote on and produced markings. <laughs> so actually what he's doing there is deriving the, the Taylor equation for lateral dispersion. Uh, but he was most well known for being Mr. Plumerize. Yep. And Gary and I worked together for 
let's see, 35 years or so, the last thing we worked on while he was, he had retired from the EPA at that point, was the Kit Fox uh, dense gas field study where he helped analyze those data and came up with dense gas dispersion theories. And he was still brilliant at that time. So uh, what Gary could do was, was cut right through and understand the basic science. And I just recently, he, he gets a bad uh, rap, we call it, because people uh, accuse his equations of being just some empirical line that he drew through some points. And actually there's a lot more to do that because he worked out the basic theory, the dynamical theory for plume rise and his basic documents include, sort of did a harmonization of plume rise theory. And just, uh, I think last year, there was a session at an AMS meeting on wildfires and they use uh, plume rise formulas for wildfire plumes. And they were saying, um, well, we need some better models because all we've got now is this Briggs formula, which is just empirical and he drew some, a line through some points. <laughs> and I was sitting in the audience. So of course I put up my hand and jumped up and said, there's a lot more behind the formula than, uh, than that. And he, he, he drew his, those lines. He had the basic theory correct too. So that's the, Briggs at Penn State or and at ATDL. More recently, and I, I wanted to mention Rex Britter's name because he is retired now and he's really not doing any science, but he it was in the same uh, vein as Panofsky, Gifford, Briggs, in that uh, he, at, well, at Cambridge University and uh, he was able to cut through the basic science and explain things and, and come up with the simplified models. And I work quite a bit with him, but now I'm, unfortunately he's retired and really isn't doing it, but we have dinner often. So it's, and uh, it's nice to still see Rex. So that's kind of a quick overview through a few people. Thank you very much, Steve. Very interesting, thank you. Um, the next question perhaps is the most difficult, Steve. Excitements, joys, regrets, and frustration in your long career. You want to talk a little about that? Okay, well, in the realm of excitements and joys, I'm, I'm often asked by my children, and I have five kids who are now in their 40s, and they say, why don't you retire? You know, I, in fact, my oldest son is thinking of retiring and he can't believe his father's still working. So he says, why, why don't you retire? And I say, well, it's, it's still interesting. You know, there's interesting projects that come up that you can work on and, and work together with a, a lot of people and come up and solve problems. So that's uh, one of the big joys. And as uh, Nick mentioned, participating in uh, conferences for the past several years, my wife and I, Linda, and, and we've gone to about every harmonization and ITM and other conference, and we have a great time interacting with all the, the scientists from around the world. So that's on the plus side, okay, regrets and frustrations. One thing is that I used to do all my programming my own software, the, the boot model evaluation software, the, the uh, cooling tower model, the, the first uh, HPDM plume model. But then once I got into consulting companies, they said, oh, you should do the science and we have staff people to do the, the programming. So I ended up just delegating programming and I really should have kept up with that. And then I'd probably be much better off now Second uh, regret, and I, this is common with a lot of people you'll talk to in the, in the small scale dispersion business is the field is drying up. <laughs> and you'll, there's not much of basic theory being taught in universities anymore. Uh, certainly in the United States, you know, things like Taylor's theory and Richardson's and Bachelor's and 
all the basic uh, stuff about Lagrangian particle modeling and boundary layer turbulence and fluxes and Monin and Obikoff and all that. So we find uh, there's fewer and fewer people know about this and the ones that do or seem to be retiring and dropping away. So uh, I'm, I'm somewhat disappointed it's drying up. Another thing is the CFD models are taking over. Yep. And this goes along with the, one of the other re regrets or complaints that I find that a lot of meteorological and dispersion work is being done these days by engineers and uh, physicists who, who don't really know the basic science, but they just uh, get the contracts from government agencies and then they end up doing the work while the, the people who have had a lot of training in it aren't, aren't doing it. This is a, a common thing mainly in the US. Another thing is that artificial intelligence, this is a big shock to me, but the past couple of AMS meetings and other meetings I've been to, there's many papers in which rather than using uh, a actual fundamental science models, deterministic models, the uh, people use big data. So they, they collect a lot of big data, they run it through some statistical software, and then they draw a line through it or a curve. <laughs> And, and that's the resulting, you know, here we've got this great, uh, now you, you don't need to worry about the science. We're, we're putting drawing lines through the data and this is what you need. So I, I keep seeing a great explosion of that. And at the, in the EPA and the, on the modeling side, you know, the models like AirMod are, Nobody's really working carefully on them like Gary Briggs used to. And, uh, you know, they don't really have the staff to do uh, detailed science backup on all the changes to AirMod, for example. And they do not go out and do a peer review by the community expert peer review on any changes to AirMod. So again, I find this trend towards just using uh, using the, the software like a computer game and then making minor corrections without so much thought to science. So that's the answer to that one. Um, you probably know about the demoting of CalPAF by the EPA. It's not a, a preferred model anymore. I was surprised and disappointed by that. I don't know if you have comments. <laughs> well, my comment, and I've, I've, I was one of the original developers of CalPuff yep. while at, at Sigma Research and under EPA funding. And, uh, I, and I also know the EPA people. I know back when John Irwin was there and c the current group, and that was more of a political thing because they, uh, the developer, Sigma Research and uh, the people who are still there did not want to give the software to the EPA. This is what I heard. And the EPA requires that they have the software, you know, the code, the, code. the actual code, yeah. And because they would never uh, give the code to the EPA, the EPA was kind of annoyed and, and therefore the CalPuff was uh, pushed towards the back burner. But nevertheless, I hear the CalPuff is still in wide use in other countries. I, I still use it in litigation cases. Uh, yeah. whenever it is appropriate to use. So yeah, uh, many people still use it, but it's not anymore a preferred one. Yeah. yeah, but I think the main reason is that they just never would give the software. In order to get the software, I think you still have to go to src.com. But there are still papers with where CalPuff is at least uh, applied uh, maybe back to back to another uh, model. So it's uh, still uh, there is activity 
with Carabao. Oh, yeah. But uh, what I wanted also to, um, um, to, to, as a remark, you made a very nice uh, uh, survey, uh, let's say, or uh, also both in, in the conference la last spring, but also today, you said uh, quite a lot of uh, the current trends. So some trends uh, you mentioned already, like big data or the CFD modeling. Do you want to add something to the uh, trends for the uh, foreseeable future? And could you maybe, take this as an opportunity to, to tell us uh, and to uh, uh, all people attending uh, uh, what your current uh, R&D work looks like and what your plans are, because I hope very strongly that you will still be for very long uh, active. Uh, we need your input also in the future, uh, Steve. So what would be your plans? Okay, well, I, I think in this section is when I plan, uh, you know, in, in addition to answering that, there are the four or the three slides that you could put those up now. You know, before I, I answer that specific question, I wanted to just give a, a quick uh, overview. Yeah, this is my my IT department mm -hmm. is helping with putting this together. Paulo is the IT department. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to to give you to build up to this, uh, th these are a few slides, uh, three slides of history that I had in this talk for the Thessaloniki Air Quality Meeting. And I, I like to point out that this whole uh, current near-scale dispersion modeling uh, field was basically generated back uh, during World War I when, uh, when there were chemical weapons used by both sides. And uh, there was a lot of research and model development. And so all, all of the, a lot of field studies and model development and analytical models by Taylor and others were developed during that period. Next slide. Okay, so then uh, the Gaussian plume models were not really in vogue back in the World War I, the, the model systems after that, but in the 50s and 60s, uh, people in uh, Pasquale and Gifford and Turner and others to put these together into operational models that could be used by agencies. And there were, at the time, new field experiments like prairie grass from 1956 and can you believe it? The prairie grass data are still oh, now yeah. the fundamental data set used for development and testing near field dispersion models. There were hundreds of samplers and can't believe it. That's uh, well, it's 64 years ago. And at the time, the K models, as opposed to Gaussian models, there were advanced analytical K models uh, diff diffusivity models, and you know, I wanted to mention what Gifford uh, Gifford knew Calder, and Calder was working on this stuff back at the same time. You know, I was at ATDL, and Calder was developing ever more complicated analytical diffusivity models, and Gifford said Calder was making mathematical mountains out of molehills. <sighs> And I, I still use that phrase when I, I'm reviewing papers. You know, I review a paper and it has all this math. And I say, oh, well, you, you're just making mathematical mountain out of a molehill. <laughs> um, okay, to go to the next slide. So then we start the Clean Air Act and uh, in the US and all the requirements for industrial models, Turner's workbook, AirMod, and in Europe, ADMS and other models. And regional models like CalPuff spray. And, and finally, the big uh, one there at the end is the, th the 3D Eulerian models, which started out uh, back, back in the 70s, once computers could be fast enough, have enough storage. 
And now there's a lot of work with these models and they, they're uh, kind of taking over and um, even at smaller scales as grid scales are reduced. So that takes us to the next slide. And this is uh, my guess of the future and my advice to students that the future is going to eventually be link linked to weather prediction models like WERF and Eulerian grid models with ever smaller grid sizes. And of course, this is what Nicholas is doing right now and has been doing. He's had linked uh, NWP and Eulerian grid models for a few decades, no, but now they keep getting smaller, uh, smaller grid sizes. And the, so you really aren't, maybe aren't going to need, uh, need AirMod and other CalPA for any of those models anymore as the grid size keeps small, getting smaller. And uh, the last bullet point there is there for the past several years, there has been a worth of version uh, with one meter grid size and other uh, numerical weather prediction models have been worked on so they can now handle buildings, flow around buildings and flow over hills and so on. So once you get down to there, uh, you can do short, short scale releases, you know, vents from uh, buildings, from chemical processing plants or dispersion in urban areas. So uh, I would imagine within the next 10 years, uh, AirMod and CalPuff and all will be outmoded and, and will be working with the uh, linked Eulerian models which really are, uh, as you go down, it's just a, a CFD model. I think once I asked Roger Pilkey the difference between CFD modeling and numerical weather prediction modeling, and he said, it's just the scale. Uh, you know, so they're all going to merge together is what I think will be happening. Yes, and especially also this, uh unification, I mean, climates and, uh, and uh, air pollution, now, they are now the same, uh, the same models can deal with uh, both the, to some extent, in spite of the fact that the scales are so different. But yeah. as, as you pointed out, we are going down, one meter is really feasible at the, at the moment as a minimum grid size. Yeah, what, what they're doing now is, is taking climate models and then downscaling them with Worf and CMAC to smaller grid sizes, exactly. but this is going to happen with the climate models too. They keep getting smaller and smaller grid sizes. Um, so maybe eventually it'll be a, a science fiction world where everything is run by one large Eulerian grid model. Maybe not one, but I, I can imagine that uh, we will really um, come to a situation where we will desperately need scientists who take care that the parameterization used in these huge models is uh, still uh, at a high level. And so therefore, the wisdom of people like yourself will certainly be always necessary to avoid that uh, all these engineers, as you, you called them before, uh, maybe disregard the need to maintain high level science. Well, yeah, I, I agree that, but on the other hand, if you improve monitoring systems and for example, if you measure CO2 at a very high resolution around the world and several heights, and you also measure the winds and so on, the AI people can just draw a line through those points too. Mm. And uh, you know, you can predict the future using uh, current knowledge developed from drawing lines through current data. I don't know. I'm just telling you what they are claiming. I hope that there's still going to be science in it. But... And so, yes. Steve, uh, what can we tell to the next generation of scientists? Uh, uh, do we still want to encourage them to study air pollution modeling or maybe do something else? 
<laughs> well, I, what I always tell students because of how things can change over the course of their career is to be sure you take basic courses, you know, not, and don't just focus on, uh, on some very specific uh, narrow niche. And uh, another thing is to be sure to, to be multidisciplinary because projects uh, these days, just about every project I, I work on, um, and I'll give you an example. Right now I'm, I'm working with a group at Harvard School of Public Health on COVID-19 spread in buildings and airplanes. And you, you have to know across the board, the uh, emissions, uh, flows, dispersion, how to calculate doses, and then how to do the final uh, interpretation. You know, so it's good to have at least some knowledge, take classes in all these different areas. And if you're doing a, a big model like CMAC, or Mars, you, it also benefits you to learn about emissions, learn about programming, learn about wind flows, and then uh, chemistry, you know, chem gas phase and, and gas uh, liquid and solid and, and uh, all, all the different things. And then finally deposition to the surface, which is very important. And uh, so you, you really need to be sure you cover all the bases. And the, and the examples I give, you know, the funding agencies change their interests over time, as many of us have discovered. And one of the examples I use is back when I was at ATDL, the, uh, the director of the Oak Ridge National Lab, Alvin Weinberg, was thinking that the future was going to all be nuclear power. And that's what everybody thought back in the 70s. And it's going to replace fossil fuels. And what is going to end up with these big complexes of many uh, nuclear power plants, you know, to be an area 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers with with eight large nuclear power plants and many cooling towers and so on. So uh, he called us up at ATDL, Alvin Weinberg, the director of the lab, and said what they need to know is the whether these big complexes will be causing uh, clouds to form and rainfall and change the climate. <laughs> so what we did back then, that was in the late 70s, is. We said, let's see, who's studying the client climate? And at NCAR, Warren Washington was there, and he's, st he's still working also. What, and he was studying the climate. We called him up and said, hey, can you run a climate model for this future world in which there's energy plants and these complexes, a meso complexes of energy plants? And so they, NCAR ran a scenario where the increased energy was coming from the nuclear plants. And uh, do you think that, how well did that work out, their, their idea that in a few decades there were going to be mesoscale complexes of nuclear plants? <laughs> Instead, we're removing all the nuclear plants and going, uh, you know, more towards renewable energy and so on. So, you know, you better watch out because today what people are telling you the future is going to look like may also end up being markedly different the way it actually plays out. Yeah, you're right, Steve. And we were lucky to be able to spend all our professional life uh, studying more or less the same topic. Most of my friends uh, were forced by events uh, to... Uh, recycle themselves uh, into other yeah. fields uh, and in the middle of in a it, it, it was a middle middle life crisis for many of them uh, it's not easy it's not easy but as uh, steve said we have to be multidisciplinary because uh, the the changes are always faster 
So the students, and it's good to advise them, to give them the advice that they have to be prepared, that it could happen that they have to change their field of work. So uh, even within, let's say, the atmospheric sciences, there are so many uh, disciplines which should, uh, changed over the last uh, decade. Oh, yeah. uh, aerosols, for instance, which are now, uh, everybody is dealing now with particulate matter, isn't it? And now yeah. we have to go uh, beyond the question of um, particle number and all these things and how, how the very, very tiny particles penetrate into the, uh, into the brain. So there are people who are, are now uh, bridging uh, let's say, the distance from uh, our science to medicine. So it is fascinating. And I believe we, are, we will never be bored. At least this is my opinion. Yeah, I, Do you agree? Yeah, I agree with you. But it, when you participate in these multidisciplinary disciplinary projects, it's good that you have the knowledge to be able to actually understand what the other people are talking about, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just being uh, isolated. Uh, one, uh, another example of a person that I wanted to bring up, I don't you know if you remember Bob Lamb oh, yeah. used to be at the EPA, and he developed he, the early predecessors to CMAC and was heavily involved, I think it was called ROM, the Regional Oxidant Model. And he was their sort of leading light golden boy. And he also did Lagrangian particle modeling yep. and did all his own programming. And the key word is he did all his own programming because he suddenly just left EPA and formed a computer programming company in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. And we, we actually, have, I've never seen him since then but I've heard from people who see him around town that he's, you know, he just completely switched fields and, uh, you know, was a really making a lot of progress in the dispersion modeling and just switched over to being a computer program, mm -hmm. I guess, because there's more money there. Sometimes in life, you have to follow the money uh, unless you really have a passion for some specific, specific field. Uh, you have to follow where the money is, where the grants are, where the client will pay for your billable time. Uh, that's, I think, is another thing that we have to tell the new generation uh, that you, you shouldn't be uh, afraid or ashamed uh, to to follow the money as long as you do it with the, with the, with the morality and with professional ethics. Yeah, the the billable time question is was uh, interesting when I switched from the government at ATDL to ERT, a private company, because at ATDL, I, I was right in the midst of developing Lagrangian particle models and had written three or four papers on it and was making great progress. As soon as I hit the private company, no agency was interested in yeah. Lagrangian particle. And in the United States, they still aren't. I don't think there's a single, maybe Bob Lamb's quick model. I mean, uh, Mike Brown's quick model at Los Alamos. But uh, so I, what I was really interested in that subject, just nothing is done. Are the agencies, no money is available. But in contrast, in Europe, there's been a lot of, of development of Lagrangian particle models. And there are many uh, countries are using them operationally for dispersion. Yeah. yeah. This is true. This is true. Yeah. Yes, very good. And, any, uh, any conclusion, uh, Steve and Nicholas? Uh, uh, this has been very interesting discussion, even much more interesting than I expected. And I had, I had high expectations. Uh, so I don't know. Any conclusion? I have a conclusion, which is simply that our students should uh, hopefully have a similar opportunities like Steve Hanna, because I can imagine that he will uh, agree with me that uh, his career was fascinating. Uh, he uh, very uh, ma many, many 
um, uh, experiences, uh, not only because of traveling, which you mentioned, but also all these collaborations. You can get in touch with people. This is today, of course, also uh, via internet, but why not? What we do now uh, is not uh, as na nice as meeting together, but well, it's uh, sustainable. You can, uh, without traveling and producing uh, uh, tons of CO2, you can really exchange opinions with people all over the world. So it's really, there are, there are developments that are not always bad. And I hope strongly that our students taking the advice from today's uh, nice interview with uh, Steve will get some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, nice uh, examples of what they should also follow in their own lifetime. Well, uh, you know, I agree that from a scientific viewpoint, Zoom calls are okay, but I still would like to go to that conference in Thessaloniki and walk down the street and go to a restaurant. <laughs> this, will, this will be done 22, so in one and a half years from now, I promise okay. you. And as, as soon as we have the vaccine, and, and if really the plans we have will be materialized and there's no reason that it's not materialized, we expect both of you, by the way, uh, springtime 22, 2017. Okay. Excellent. That's a good way to conclude our interview with the uh, proposing this meeting in Saloniki, which I have good memory of Porto Caras. Also, uh, Nicolas, uh, you remember you and I did oh, the yes. conference together. That was very successful in the 80s. Yes. Very good, gentlemen. I'll uh, thank you again for everything. I'll